Hello and welcome to Marsh's Library, Ireland's oldest public library, founded back in 1707. We're here in the first gallery, surrounded by the books from the Stillingfleet collection, purchased by our founder, Archbishop Narcissus Marsh, to be the main bulk of the library. These books cover a huge range of different subjects, history, philosophy, travel, religion, medicine, law, mathematics and music. You'll notice there's a couple of different colours, some are dark, some are much lighter. The lighter bound ones are bound in a parchment rather than leather binding, and it's simply a cheaper way to buy your books, the idea being you could always replace it with a leather version later on. Now, in the library, we run regular exhibitions every year. These cover a huge range of subjects, because the library itself covers a huge range of subjects. Our current one is about China, basically looking at the interactions between Europeans and Chinese in the 16th and 17th centuries. You'll see a little example of it here. As I say, the library goes back to 1707, and an act of parliament that made us a public library forever. And this is still a working library. People come in here through the year studying the books. Now, these days it has to be done by appointment. That wasn't always the case. Sometimes through the library's history, people have just been able to come in and study. And that has led to some issues, particularly with book theft, and we'll discuss that towards the end of the tour. But if you have a little look to your sides, you'll notice gaps in the bays. There would have been benches in here, and we'll see those again in the second gallery, and that's where people would have studied up until 1776. Before then, people would have been able to read anywhere. They would sit there, studying away, often out of sight of the librarian, and able to reach up and take books down from the shelves. Now, the man we see up here in this portrait this is our founder, Archbishop Narcissus Marsh, an Englishman who came to Ireland originally to take over as Provost of Trinity College. It wasn't a job he enjoyed. Uh, he wasn't happy with the standard of education in the country, but he also wasn't happy with what the role entailed. He'd been at Oxford for, before then for 21 years, and in his time there, he'd become a fellow of the college, and he was used to spending time with his books. That was becoming increasingly impossible for him, and it was something he has to be said he was very unhappy about. He was particularly upset with having spent a lot of time in meetings with local businesses, trying to raise money for the university. So he leaves the college and enters the church, rising up in 1694 to become Archbishop of Dublin. And we're built here on part of the grounds of the old Archbishop's Palace. People may not know it, but Kevin Street Garda Station originally started in life as the Palace of the Archbishop of Dublin. Why it got taken over by the police forces? It had high, strong walls and lots of staving for the mounted police forces. Now, Marsh is the person who puts up the money for the library to be founded, and it's built in two stages. So we're going to go along now into the middle room, which is our old reading room, and then we'll turn into the latter part of the library, the second gallery, which is added on just a little bit later. In that old reading room, people studying there would be the likes of James Joyce, who comes in here in 1902, and he mentions coming in to study in the library in Ulysses, referencing the fading prophecies of Joachim Abbas, one of the books he studies here in the stagnant bays, as he refers to it, at Marsh's Library. Bram Stoke would have also been a regular visitor here back in the 1860s, and Jonathan Swift is known to have frequented the library as well. Now, Swift had originally opposed the building of the library, not because necessarily he didn't want the library here in Dublin, but because he didn't get on with our founder, Archbishop Marsh. They were both very different personalities. Now, the head of the library was always known as the librarian and the keeper. These days we call our person the director, but we do still have a librarian who works here with the collection, with the readers coming in every day. And we're going to step into the reading room now and meet her, uh, Amy Boylan, and she's going to tell us about a few of the items from the collection. So if you want to come with me. So we're going to look at some very curious books from the late 17th, early 18th century. So this is an era of great change in Europe. So on the one hand, we've got the beginnings of the scientific revolution. So the Europeans are starting to understand their world a little bit more, but there's still a lot that's unknown. And then it's also the age of exploration. So we have explorers coming back from far flung places like in Asia and in the Americas, and they're bringing back with them really interesting and unusual things that Europeans had never seen and seemed quite incredible, really. So 
it's it's oftentimes difficult to distinguish between what's real, what's myth, and what's fiction. And if you think about it, these people weren't seeing a lot of these um, incredible things for themselves, but they were being relayed to them secondhand by explorers. So we'll have a look at uh, the first book, anyway, from 1638 which is by an Italian doctor called Licenti, and it's called On Monsters. So here we can see definitely a few creatures that have been consigned to legend and myth now. So we've got an elephant-headed person, a centaur, some, I'm not sure what these guys are, but they seem to have the tails of a pig, something like that, and the head of a human, which would have been really interesting, this idea of like part human, part other creature. And um, this this coexisted in this book with um, actual real um, abnormalities, which were something that Licenti was quite interested in because he was a doctor. And so he had seen some of these things actually in his surgery. So, for example, we have images of conjoined twins here, which are kind of fascinating. And there were some of his contemporaries who thought that these sort of abnormalities were... Um, the result of sin, but Licenti didn't believe this. He thought that they were just good examples of the um, the beauty of nature and the inf infinite variety and how it could make something beautiful out of imperfections. So the next book is the history of Formosa. So Formosa is now known as Taiwan, and this book explores the language and the culture and the history of the island and is told by this man, George Salamanazar, who claimed to be a, a local of Formosa, Formosan. But actually it was all hooey. So this is one of the great literary hoaxes of the 18th century. Salamanazar was actually born in France, probably France, and um, set himself up first as Irish, then was Japanese, and was just kind of tapping into credulous Europeans' interest in the exotic. But fair dues to him, he went so far as to create a whole language to pass himself off as Formosan. So here we have a plate of the Formosan alphabet. There's also a calendar, a monetary system. We can see this image of the funeral procession that he said happened, which involves, you can see these elephants pulling carts here, people astride them. Um, and his book, which was published in London in 1704, was um, a huge bestseller. And people um, which were just overcome with excitement about Formosa and a brief Formosan cra craze ensued. Uh, he was revealed to be a fraudster at the time, but he didn't kind of let, let it get him down. And um, he, he published a spirited defense of all of his tales, continuing to claim that he was, in fact, from Formosa. And um, he appears in uh, Swift's A Modest Proposal and was, in fact, possibly the inspiration for Gulliver's Travel. So here is another history of an exotic land. So in this case, it's the history of Ethiopia. So we can see a, a nice image of a rather fierce looking hippo here. This was the collaboration between a German scholar, Hyob Ludolf, and um, an Ethiopian priest named Abba Gorgoyos, and it was published in 1681. Um, as well as these lovely hippos, we can also see some nice monkeys. Where are they? Here they are. And Ludolf describes Abyssinia as Ethiopian, as Ethiopia was known at the time, as having more wild beasts than anywhere else in the world, and that the most monstrous of these were the elephants, who you can see here, who have great expressions, but maybe look a bit pig-like, rather. They're not entirely anatomically correct, I wouldn't say, but um, he said that they would, were capable of you know, pulling up trees by their trunks or shaking the trees until their trunks fell off. And so we have a nice kind of example again of sort of certain level of scientific accuracy and history mingled with kind of myth and legend being perpetuated. Mm. Then we also have a lot of medical texts being published at this time. So this is Cowper's Anatomy, published in 1698. So you can see a nice plate here showing the uh, fingerprint. So this is the first published image of the fingerprint, sort of laying the foundations for forensics. And there are 105 really exquisite graving, engravings in this orc. So here you can see the foot 
and all of its tendons and all of its muscles. Um, but and we've got some nice. Let's see, we've got a nice image of a skeleton here, looking very animated. And another one back here at this kind of jaunty angle. This work is probably most famous as one of the early scientific um, examples of plagiarism. So Cowper was a surgeon and an anatomist. So you can see him here. And um, the plates, the 105 engravings that are uh, featured in this book, actually existed previously in a book published by um, a Dutch anatomist named Bidlu. Now, one of the editions of his books hadn't sold very well, so Cowper bought up all of the engravings and then added new text in English. So you can see the text is all in English. And um, but gave no when he published it, he gave no credit at all to either Bidlou or Gérard de Lessier, who produced the images from which the engravings were made. Um, so as you can imagine, Bidlou didn't take very well to this, and there was a bit of a heated uh, relationship between the two with pamphlets written supporting one or supporting the other so it's just um, a very interesting example we have one more plate before we move on and this is uh, showing very portraying in quite accurate detail the human anatomy book we're going to look at is a book on fish by Ulysses Aldrovandi, considered by many to be the father of natural history. So here you can see a ray, you know, oh, it's quite beautiful. This is a, a woodcut of a ray and you can see all of the detail is really quite exquisite. So here these, and again, quite accurate, but like a lot of these other books, it also features maybe slightly less accurate examples of fish. So here, this guy looks a bit like a unif unicorn fish, but is most probably a narwhal. What else have we got? Um, and then this, I mean, this is some kind of eel, but what's going on here? I'm not really too sure. This little turtle's come to see what's happening. And that's that. Thanks. Well, thanks for that, Amy. And as I say, we're here in the middle of the old reading room. We're going to go along now into the second gallery. It's out a little bit later, and the reason is simple. Marsh didn't know for certain whether the legislation that would make this library a public library forever would go ahead. So he waits before shelving the books and building this second gallery until that act is passed through. So follow me on inside. We have two collections of books in this room. On this side of me, it's Marsh's own collection. Uh, a lot of Hebrew texts, also a lot of mathematical texts. Marsh is a big fan of going through books, finding mistakes and correcting them when it came to maths. And he was known as a Hebrew scholar. He taught Hebrew at Oxford before coming to Ireland. On this side of me, my left, it's the collection that comes into the library last, the Stern Collection, added in 1745. This is very different to the rest of the collections. The rest of the books in the library, for the most part, they're in Latin. They're very much scholarly texts, books for study. These is a lot more books printed in English, and they're printed more in England or Ireland. And there's a lot more of what might be called light reading, a lot more plays, a lot more poems, things like that. Now, in the second gallery, the story is kind of well known at this stage, or it's become well known of the ghost of Archbishop Marsh. And it's this area that he supposedly haunts, searching for a note that his niece Grace left him when she eloped to marry a clergyman named Charles Proby. Uh, they were married out in a pub. The reason was her uncle wouldn't give permission for the marriage to go ahead, so they had to go and have a private ceremony. They couldn't have a church ceremony. Nobody knows why Marsh is against this. It would have made sense for him to be able to, to support his niece through this marriage. He'd been able to help out her husband in his role as archbishop. But for whatever reason, he didn't. He was against it. And when she eloped, she leaves a note in one of the books asking her uncle to forgive him. And because he never finds a note, he never forgives her. His ghost is now forced to haunt the library at night, searching away for that missing, missing note. Now, it has to be said, we've checked all the books in this room. 
Uh, we do start check quite regularly. We've never found anything ourselves. So either he's found it already and moved on, or it may never have been there. We do know that Marsh and Grace actually got on quite well after the, after the wedding. Uh, he forgave her quite quickly. But in saying that, anyone who works in the lounge will tell you that when you're in here late at night, it certainly seems entirely possible that there's somebody watching you from the bays as you go along the second gallery. It is north facing, it's a little bit colder, and there is definitely a little kind of atmosphere in here. One story we do know is true, and in its own way, I think it's actually a little bit spookier, is the story of the mummy found here. So in the 1880s, a mummy is discovered in one of the cupboards. Nobody knows where it's come from, nobody knows how it comes to be there. When it's originally discovered, they actually believe that somebody has basically been murdered in the library and the body has been hidden there. They don't realise that this body is in fact several thousand years old. And they go next door to Kevin Street, the police come round, and it takes about a half an hour to realise that in fact this body you know, has been here a little bit longer than anyone realised. The suspicion is it comes in about the 1750s, that's when the paperwork and bits and pieces around it were from. At that time, it could have either come from the verger of the cathedral next door, who had served as a chaplain in the Levant Company, or it could have been a friend of the librarians here, um, who was known to have spent a lot of time travelling in that part of the world. Whatever happens, the mummy comes to the library, it's in a cupboard, and it's very quickly sent off once it's rediscovered. It's sent down to the anatomy department in Trinity College. About a year after it gets there, there's a dissection done on it on its right hand. There's a record of that. And that's the last time anything is heard about it until 2012. That year, they find a headless mummy. Where do they find it? Underneath the lecture hall. It's pushed right against the very back, leaning against the wall. And the funny thing is, it wasn't the only mummy found under a lecture hall that year. They also found one in University College, Cork. And it was the one in Cork we heard about first. And we did a kind of brief check up with them, looking for the details and comparing it to the one that had been found in Marsh's. Found out that it wasn't the right one, that it wasn't the one that had left Marsh's library. But it was just after that, that one of the discoverers of the one in Trinity College happened to be in here studying. And the subject came up in conversation, and he was able to tell us about the light, about the mummy that they'd found there. And we were able to realise that it was the one missing from Marsh's library. But since it left, it was now missing its head and its right hand. Now, we'll follow along down here into the cages. The cages are one of the best known features of Marsh's library. They're possibly mentioned in the 1730s for the first time. There's a reference to wire-covered bays where the manuscripts are kept. Um, but we do know 1776, they've become one of only two places in the library you can read. Either in the old reading room where we were just with Amy, or locked into these cages you'll see now in a moment. So these are the famous reading cages. Now, the reason they changed the rules in 1776, as I mentioned earlier, was theft. People were outside the librarian, able to reach up, take books down, into bags, pockets, out the door, never to be seen again. So they make it that you have to be supervised. If you can't be supervised, you'll be locked into these cages. How often they were used, we don't really know. Um, there is certainly an account of a regular reader who used to be locked in here overnight. Um, we'll try not to think about the bathroom arrangements with that one. But he would continue his studies through the night, presumably working with a lamp. You'll notice here in the second one, there's a cast of a skull. The skull of Stella, the lady friend of Jonathan Swift. In 1826, St. Patrick's Cathedral flooded. This wasn't uncommon. There's an underground river runs just across the road and pretty regularly floods. And Swift actually asked to be buried in a particular part of the cathedral on the grounds that that area had never flooded before. And he's worried what will happen should that ever should his body ever be exposed and he's quite right to clearly because 1826 the cathedral floods himself and Stella's bodies are exposed and casts are made of both their skulls this is due to an interest in the time of the subject of phrenology the idea you can determine a person's personality by the shape of their skull uh, at a meeting of the royal society that year where these skulls are displayed 5,000 people entertained 
5,000 people attend. Um, but in fact, it does kind of change the way we look at SWIFT afterwards. These, because William Wilde, Oscar Wilde's father, uh, does a study of these in the 1840s, and he's able to realize that the issues that may have uh, plagued SWIFT in his later years were probably caused by a loose bone within his inner ear. Uh, just behind you now, you'll see there's a door floating in the wall. I mentioned the Archbishop's Palace next door, and this door would have connected onto an astronomy tower, and that tower to the, to the palace next door, providing a private entrance for the Archbishops. Uh, it gets knocked down in the 1760s. The Archbishops have moved out of the palace by that stage, and what's happened is various businesses are setting up in the outbuildings, and some of those are working with chemicals, and there's a real risk of fire. So they make a decision to knock down the tower so that if the palace catches fire, it won't spread as easily to the library here. Um, we hope you've enjoyed your visit to Marsha's library. Do come in and visit us. If you have any questions, we're available all across social media. Um, you can find us uh, at Marsha's library on Instagram and Twitter. And you'll also find us on Facebook as well. You can also email us. If you have any queries, our website is marshlibrary.ie. So thank you and goodbye.